All right, I guess I'll watch one more movie. <sighs> I love this one. Yes, it came from outer space. Quinn, it's Halloween. Let's go trick or treating. I want candy. Why do you do this? I've literally never seen you eat candy on Halloween or ever. But I love Halloween. Please, Quinn, just this once. No, I've got stuff to do. I'm working on a video about aliens. I don't have time to take you trick-or-treating even if I wanted to. Wait, you're making a video about me? No, not you. Scary aliens. But what am I supposed to do? It's Halloween. I don't know. Go play video games or something. Use my PC. Fine, I'm going upstairs to play The Sims. Now, let's see. Where was I? Ah, yes. I love aliens. There's something about the thought of extraterrestrials that's just captivating to me. I've always loved science fiction, so aliens were a big part of my childhood. E.T., Close Encounters of the Third Kind, the idea that aliens could exist, and that they could have this incredible technology that would allow them to travel the stars and leap between galaxies, made me believe that anything was possible. Maybe one day humanity could join in in the dance of cosmic civilization. But then there's the other side of the coin too. Yes, the thought of a universe bustling with fantastic life and fantastic technology is exciting. It's also scary too. Not every alien would be friendly like E.T. Maybe they wouldn't come and simply play music notes like the aliens in Close Encounters. What about the Body Snatchers? What about Ripley's Xenomorph? the dark and twisted forms of the Lovecraftian mythos. Aliens might not be our friends. The dark side of extraterrestrials has been explored in books, movies, and TV shows for decades now. Stories of alien encounters and abductions have captivated our minds for years and years. But what makes aliens so scary? To understand this, we have to dive into the history of aliens in science fiction, and the true historical events that inspired some of these stories. We'll also discuss some of my favorite horrifying depictions of aliens in books, movies, and TV shows. All in all, we're in for a pretty spooky evening. It's time for the second ever Quinn's Ideas Halloween Special. The giant bodies in outer space that we would eventually call galaxies were originally discovered by French astronomer Charles Messier in the 17th century. Edwin Hubble in 1923 was the first to realize what they actually were. It turned out that there were actually countless galaxies in our universe, made up of billions upon billions of stars and trillions of planets. It did not take humans long at all to do what we do best, imagine. If there were trillions of planets throughout the vastness of space, could there be another world like ours, with sentient beings like us? From that point onward, we begin to see aliens everywhere. First, let's talk about one of the most iconic, if not the most iconic alien moment in United States history. And to set things up, I'm gonna quote one of my favorite lines from the book God Emperor of Dune by Frank Herbert. We are myth killers, you and I, Maneo. That is the dream we share. I assure you from a god's Olympian perch that government is a shared myth. When the myth dies, the government dies. A government can only function if it can continue to justify its hierarchy in the minds of the populace. There will always be some mistrust between citizens and governments, but really bad things happen when people lose faith in their government entirely. The Roswell crash has captivated the minds of believers for decades and become an obsession for some, largely because being mistrustful of the government seems to be society's natural state. It is easy for people to believe that the government could and would cover up something, something like 
an alien ship crash if it happened. The Roswell incident is one of my favorite stories slash American legends. Now most people, definitely most Americans, have heard the story of the Roswell crash. But in case you haven't, I'll reiterate. In 1947, in the deserts of New Mexico, an object crashed from the sky. More than 30 years later, in 1980, Charles Berlitz and William L. Moore published The Roswell Incident. According to this book, an alien craft had been flying over the desert of New Mexico, observing nuclear bomb testing activity. By the way, lots of alien experts, I guess, claim that it was in fact nuclear bombs that alerted the alien life forms to our presence on Earth, or at least increased already ongoing monitoring of the planet. Anyway, this alien ship was supposedly hit by lightning according to the Roswell incident. This caused the vessel to crash, killing the extraterrestrials on board. The United States government would then go on to cover up the actual event. The official government story of what actually went down in Roswell states that the crash was no more than a mere weather balloon accident. So maybe that explains it. Except it kind of doesn't. There are some things about this story that are just plain weird. Now, the Roswell incident was not the first flying saucer story Americans ever heard. In fact, several incidents had been reported nationally just that summer. What made this different, however, is this was the first reported crash of such an object and the first account of a flying saucer confirmed by a government organization. The next day following the report of the crash, the Roswell Army Airfield, the RAAF, released the following statement. The many rumors regarding the flying disc became a reality yesterday when the intelligence office of the 509th Bomb Group of the 8th Air Force, Roswell Army Airfield, was fortunate enough to gain possession of a disc through the cooperation of one of the local ranchers and the sheriff's office of Chaves County. The statement also states that a man named Major Jesse Marshall was the intelligence officer who oversaw the investigation of the crash site. The statement very clearly confirms that what they had recovered was some sort of flying disc, not a weather balloon. Right? Hmm, let's dig deeper. The next day, following a story detailing the crash by the Roswell Daily, the United States Army changed their story. They retracted the statement that they had recovered a flying disc and instead stated that they had found the debris of a weather balloon. The next day, the Roswell Daily ran a story which featured a photograph of Major Marcel posing with pieces of what appeared to be weather balloon debris. Of course, many did not believe this story and the lack of government transparency did not help. This story stoked conspiracy theories and suspicion for years until finally in 1994, the US Air Force admitted that the weather balloon story had been in fact faked. Here the government claimed that the object had actually been a highly classified spy device. The object was supposedly connected to a string of high altitude balloons equipped with microphones. According to the 1994 report, they had been intended to float over the USSR. Now the description of this technology doesn't exactly sound like a flying disc. And then there were also the reports that bodies were removed from the crash. In 1997, the United States government released a statement denying the rumor that bodies had been recovered from the crash site. Instead, they claimed that the so-called bodies were in fact test dummies rather than the corpses of alien life forms. I think there is a clear reason that the Roswell story has been so captivating over the years. The thought of a conspiracy is compelling, and when the government completely lacks transparency and often changes their story, it only adds fuel to the fire. And why does the United States government keep addressing this story at all? I mean, was there really a need to bring up the story again and change details 50 years later? But no matter what you believe about the Roswell incident, you can't deny that it did stoke the UFO phenomenon. And it also became the inspiration for an insane amount of awesome science fiction stories, some of which we'll go into in just a little bit. The end of the 1960s would bring another event that would again stoke interest in extraterrestrials. However, the moon landing, unlike the localized Roswell incident, would be reported on and watched globally. Apollo 11 was launched by the Saturn V rocket from Florida, sending three astronauts, Commander Neil Armstrong, Michael Collins, and Buzz Aldrin further into outer space than any humans had ever been. 
Aldrin, unlike Armstrong and Collins, never actually landed on the surface of the moon. Instead, he piloted the moon module in lunar orbit while the other two explored the surface. You might have heard the rumor that Buzz Aldrin actually saw a UFO whilst piloting, though this claim may be technically true. UFO doesn't mean alien spaceship necessarily. And Aldrin later confirmed that he was 99% sure the object had merely been a detached adapter panel from the spacecraft. So that solves that, unless the government forced him to lie about it like in Roswell. Speaking of government conspiracies, I know there's a portion of people out there that don't believe the moon landing was real, but guys, honestly, we can see the flag. It happened, okay? But whether or not it did, mankind's landing on the moon was a giant moment for science fiction. If we can land on the moon in the real world, what amazing things can we do in the fictional world? Perhaps travel to other planets? Planets that might be inhabited? If you ask most people, well, my audience at least, if they believe in aliens, most people would say, yes, aliens almost certainly exist somewhere out there in the universe, but the likelihood that they have visited us is slim. That, however, doesn't change the fact that some people firmly believe that aliens have visited us. Incidents of UFO sightings have become relatively common in the last century or so. People report unidentified flying objects all the time. The vast majority of cases, of course, can be dismissed, but there are a few that simply defy explanation. We simply don't know. One of these examples is the aerial school UFO incident. 60 school children in Zimbabwe, aged 6 to 12, claim to have seen alien spacecrafts land. The robed in black figure supposedly communicated an environmental message. Those kids are adults today, and those that speak out publicly still have the same story. Now you could chalk this all up to mass hysteria or faults of memory, but the truth is, as I said, we just don't know. What we do know is that we, as a society, are obsessed with the idea that aliens are here, watching over us. Maybe they are benevolent, here to help us in some way. Maybe they are here for a different reason. Maybe all of this is yet again the result of mankind's incredible imagination. Either way, the same is true for me as it was when I was a kid. Whether or not aliens are here, whether or not they even exist, I want to believe. More than anything, I really do think it is fear that makes the thought of aliens compelling to us. As the world becomes more connected, more the same, true alienness becomes harder and harder to encounter. It becomes more rare. So we look to the stars and project our fear of the other onto the ultimate other the extraterrestrial. Whoa. What the heck was that? I'll be right back, guys. Hello? Is anyone out here? Is anyone out here? Okay, that was weird. Anyway, let's move on with the video. So why are aliens scary? There are several reasons that I can point to. It has been said that the oldest fear is the fear of the unknown. The fear of the unknown stands at the root of some of our greatest horror stories. Infamous but brilliant writer H.P. Lovecraft 
has influenced the entire horror genre, his work speaks because it reflects his genuine fear of the unknown and of the other. The fear of the other is at the root of our fear of aliens. Aliens are scary because we don't know them. We can't predict their behavior. They could be cruel. They could see us as bugs beneath them. They could enslave us, steal our world's resources, and then discard us. They could, in essence, do to us what we do to each other, or perhaps even worse. Infinite terrors await within the unknown. We peer into the darkness of space, and yet we do not know what might be peering back, or what it might be capable of. The fear of colonization is at the root of what is likely the most famous trope in science fiction, the alien invasion. Now this motif has been around since the 1800s. In fact, H.G. Wells wrote War of the Worlds, the most famous alien invasion story of all time, in 1898. But the concept really took off in the 1950s and especially the 1960s following the start of the Cold War. Tons of alien invasion movies were released around this time. Freddie Francis's They Came From Beyond, Terence Fisher's The Earth Dies Screaming, Steve Seckley's The Day of the Trifids, Don Siegel's Invasion of the Body Snatchers, Maury Dexter's The Day Mars Invaded Earth. The list goes on indefinitely. And it wasn't just movies, tons of books too, trust me. Basically, we've seen throughout history time and time again how things usually go when a technologically superior group encounters a less developed civilization. Usually the less developed civilization is far worse off in the end, if not completely destroyed. Often they lose agency and any claim to ancestral land that should be rightfully theirs. Humans can't help but project these ideas onto a potentially technologically superior, advanced, extraterrestrial race. If this is how it goes most of the time on Earth, why would interaction between species of different worlds be any different? Life, after all, is a competition of resources, and there are finite resources in the universe. What would drive a species to expend the incredible amount of resources and energy that would be required to travel great distances of space, if not the desire to acquire more resources? Though this of course isn't necessarily the case, this is a big part of what keeps this fear in our minds when we think about intelligent spacefaring alien life. Another motif in science fiction which seems to have gained traction around the late 1950s features the reproductive capabilities of women as the target of alien invaders. The aliens want to breed with us, to taint our genes with their hideous foreign DNA. The root fear here is of course xenophobia. If you look at Giger's creation for Ridley Scott's film Alien, the creature is literally called the Xenomorph. Xeno equals different and morph to undergo change. And if you haven't seen Alien, spoiler alert, the Xenomorph forcefully impregnates its host in order to reproduce. Now, listen to me carefully here because I'm obviously not saying that everyone that has a fear of being impregnated by an extraterrestrial is xenophobic towards foreigners. In fact, I'd argue that the vast majority are not. However, when we examine the history of this motif, we see pretty clearly what the root fear is. The trope gained traction in the 1950s and 60s, at a time when the United States was going through a period of immense change. The civil rights movement was in full swing, different races of people were beginning to mix and mingle more and more, which was a great thing. But also, of course, a lot of people didn't like this. This caused a lot of, let's say, anxiety for some people. That anxiety, I think, manifested itself in the media of the time in one way as the aliens want our women trope. Nowadays, of course, aliens breeding with humans is just a staple of the genre. The root of the motif, however, like the root of many things, is a bit dark. Examples of this motif include 1958's film I Married a Monster from Outer Space. In this movie, grotesque male aliens masquerade in the form of human men in order to impregnate women. They flee from Earth once their breeding plan is exposed. There's also a 1960s Village of the Damned and 1981's Inseminoid. And of course, also tons of books which use this trope. Women being impregnated by alien life forms has historically been an extremely common theme 
especially in science fiction films. Interestingly enough, in the 1990s, we really saw a kind of reversal of this trope. One example, who we will talk about more later, is Syl from the movie Species. Syl is a female alien who essentially requires the DNA of human men in order to breed. So it's a flip because no longer is the woman a damsel that must be saved from the terrifying spaceman from another world, but instead she is the alien terror herself, and all men despair. There is also an aspect of this trope that has to do with alien beings altering our biology in such a way that it brings into question what it even means to be human. Octavia Butler deals with this concept in her Xenogenesis trilogy, in which the alien lifeforms known as the Oankali seek to merge their DNA with that of humanities. The main takeaway from all this is that we are the aliens. And no, I don't mean it like that, although maybe. But what I really mean is that our fears of aliens reflect who we are. Aliens are scary to us because we project the bad side of humanity onto them. All the things that we fear from aliens are things that human beings have already done and are doing to each other. There's one final fear I want to talk about before we talk about some of the creepiest aliens in science fiction. I've heard it often said that the thought of humanity being alone in the universe is existentially terrifying. But funny enough, the idea that we are not alone can be equally scary to some. Some religions, for instance, believe that humans are God's sole children, created in his image. If aliens exist, it puts into question various religious texts that do not account for other sentient civilizations from beyond the stars. If we are alone, we are all that is. If we are not, then that means that one day, we might have to face what else is out there, for better or for worse. So now that we've talked about that, we can get on to, wait, where did this flower pot come from? It wasn't in my set. Wait a second. These aren't my clothes. What? What is going on right now? I'll be right back, guys. What the hell? Whew, okay, that's better. That was super weird. Don't know what the deal with that was, but anyway, moving on. So now that we've gone over what makes the general concept of aliens scary, it's time to talk about some of my favorite books depicting scary aliens. So now that we've gone over what makes the general concept of aliens scary, let's discuss some of my favorite books depicting scary aliens. Now keep in mind, these are just my opinions and there are tons of alien books, so I couldn't mention everything. List your favorites in the comment section below. We can't talk about terrifying aliens without talking about the most famous alien invasion story of all time. Now, we've discussed this book before on this channel, particularly in my video, The First Aliens, but in this video we're going to focus on something slightly different than just the themes and the narrative of the book. Instead, we will talk about the book's cultural impact. H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds was first published in book form in 1898. The story, which was first serialized in a magazine, was initially successful, but gained new cultural relevance in the United States when Orson Welles' radio show, The Mercury Theater on the Air, aired a special Halloween episode featuring the story. The broadcast is famous because apparently some people that were listening didn't realize that they were hearing a radio drama broadcast. Instead, some people became convinced that Martians were actually invading the Earth. You see, the first two-thirds of the broadcast were presented as a series of news bulletins, which caused some listeners to panic. Now, though, it's basically been proven that newspapers at the time over-exaggerated the size of the panic, it's undeniable that H.G. Wells' story got a boost in popularity following the event. The first movie adaptation would appear in 1953, and since then, there have been countless adaptations and parodies of H.G. Wells' classic story. What's scary about the Martians in this story is that, as we would study a tiny microbe in a petri dish, they studied us and waited for just the right moment to strike. H.P. Lovecraft is one of the most influential horror authors of all time. 
My last Halloween special was entirely dedicated to breaking down his most famous story, The Call of Cthulhu. Here we're going to talk about another of Lovecraft's monstrous creations, Azathoth. Outside the ordered universe is that amorphous blight of nethermost confusion which blasphemes and bubbles at the center of all infinity. The boundless daemon, Sultan Azathoth, whose name no lips dare speak aloud, and who gnaws hungrily in inconceivable unlighted chambers beyond time and space amidst the muffled, maddening beating of vile drums and the thin, monotonous whine of accursed flutes. The Dream Quest of Unknown Kadath. Azathoth is a monstrous being at the center of the galaxy. He is the supreme entity, more powerful than any others in Lovecraft's mythos. He has many names, the Blind Dreamer, Nuclear Chaos, the Deep Dark, the Blind Idiot God, the Primordial Demiurge, but most simply, he is the Supreme Lord and Creator of all things. Azathoth has no definite form, or at least those who envision him see him in various forms. Azathoth is scary because many people wonder if there is a God, an omnipotent creator in charge of all things. People tend to assume that if such a god exists, it would have our best interest in mind, or at least it would be concerned with us to some degree. But realistically, if we look at the chaos of the world, the chaos of the universe, does any of it really suggest that? One terrifying possibility, if a god does exist, is that god is an immense entity of cosmic chaos and darkness, terrible to behold an entity whose name itself should not be spoken, an alien monstrosity of mindless eternal horror. Ancient legends of ultimate chaos at whose center sprawls the blind idiot god Azathoth, lord of all things, encircled by his flopping horde of mindless and amorphous dancers, and lulled by the thin monotonous piping of a demonic flute held in nameless pause. The Haunter in the Dark now let's talk about the Scramblers from Peter Watt's Blind Sight. I've actually done a couple videos on this channel going into this novel, and you can check those out linked in the description. Long story short, the Scramblers are a non-sentient, intelligent race of beings. They may have had actual consciousness at some point in their evolution, and eventually grew beyond the need of it. Either way, the spooky thing about them, and other aliens like them depicted in science fiction, is what they imply about us. Consciousness and self-awareness wasn't a necessity for the Scramblers to gain space travel. It was not a necessity for them to learn to communicate with us with seeming comprehension. It all kind of implies that maybe human consciousness is a fluke. Maybe sapience is not really necessary. Maybe it's even a hindrance. I think that the idea of this is particularly terrifying today because in a lot of ways it does kind of feel like humanity is devolving in intelligence. We are thinking for ourselves less and less and becoming more dependent on computing machines to do our mental labor. And you know, in a lot of ways that's the way humanity has always been. If there is a crutch to lean on, we will lean on it. It is very easy for people not to think for themselves and just to choose to go along with the crowd and become just another non-thinking member of the horde. So we have to talk about the Trisolarans from Shushin Luz, Remembrance of Earth's Past trilogy. The Trisolarans mainly represent the fear of a technologically advanced civilization which is able to subjugate and annihilate humanity through their vastly superior technology. The Trisolarans themselves aren't scary in the traditional sense, and humanity never physically interacts with the Trisolarans at any point during the war. And yet, Trisolaran technology is able to cripple Earth's technological growth and destroy Earth's entire space force before any Trisolaran individual ever gets close to our solar system. I've done an entire series on the Three Body Problem series and the Trisolaran, so if you want to learn more about that, click on the playlist in the description. The glimpse we get of the Trisolaran civilization in the first book shows us that their society is devoid of individuality, art, and love. It is a society that exists only to survive and to serve the greater society. This aspect of Trisolaran society is spooky because it warns of what humanity could potentially be in the real world. 
Humanity is defined by the things the Trisolarans lack. It is the same reason that the Borg in Star Trek are scary, but don't worry, we'll get to Star Trek later on. Next up is Lock and Key. So if you've seen Netflix's version of this graphic novel, forget about it. Throw it away. Zip zap. It's gone. It doesn't exist. It never existed. In all seriousness though, if you love that show, more power to you. But the book! The book! Joe Hill has been writing some of the best horror stories for years now. There's Nosferatu, The Black Phone. I really love The Cape 1 and 2. I thought they were really fun and dark and twisted. Joe Hill is doing some really great things. And because he is the son of probably the greatest horror author of all time, Stephen King, he seems to be somewhat a fan of the work of H.P. Lovecraft, and it shows. Spoilers ahead. Essentially in lock and key, there is a door, though it doesn't always look like a door. It is deep within a cave near the ocean. The things that wait on the other side of the door desperately want the door to be opened. They whisper from the other side. At some point, a lock was created, a lock forged from a strange metal which had come through the other side of the door. It was the only thing that could hold the door closed. And the Omega Key, also forged from the same metal, is the only thing that can open the lock. The creatures on the other side can only exist in our world if they have flesh to inhabit. So in order to live, they must steal the body of a human. Now the interesting thing is, one of these creatures is free, and it desperately wants to open the door. But first it has to get the keys from the keepers of the keys. It's plural because there are actually a lot more keys in this story than just the Omega Key. And they all do various things. There's a lot to this story actually. What makes this particular aspect of the story scary is that there is a door to another place. A door which can be relatively easily opened. And if it is opened, an unspeakable darkness will enter our world and inhabit our skin. I know what you're saying, Quinn, this really isn't an alien story. I know, but it is Lovecraftian, and if we're talking about interdimensionality, then what really is the fundamental difference between extraterrestrials of our own physical dimension and beings from another dimension? Stephen King, like his son Joe Hill, obviously grew up reading the work of Lovecraft. In his book It, he creates one of the scariest Lovecraftian beings to ever appear on paper. The creature referred to throughout the novel only by the pronoun it. Spoilers ahead, we learn about two-thirds of the way through the novel that this creature came to Earth from beyond outer space, a place called the Macroverse, basically the greater universe that our universe is merely a speck within. This creature and another creature which was its opposite, called the Turtle, were alive before the beginning of the universe. The Turtle was a creature of life and creation, it was a being of malevolence and consumption. During the vast eons of its early existence, it fed upon the petty forms within the macroverse, but eventually it wanted better food. So it came to Earth, millions of years before mankind ever even existed, and it waited. It waited beneath the place that would eventually become the town of Derry, its killing pin. It waited for humanity because unlike the petty forms of the macroverse or the lower animals of Earth, human beings could truly dream. With our imaginations, we can conjure up visions of the greatest pleasure and the greatest terrors. It had come here long after the turtle withdrew into its shell, here to Earth, and it had discovered a depth of imagination here that was almost new, almost of concern. This quality of imagination made the food very rich. Its teeth writ flesh gone stiff with exotic terrors and voluptuous fears. They dreamed of night beast and moving muds. Against their will they contemplated endless gulfs. Once humanity came along, this creature existed in a constant cycle of waking to feed upon the fear and flesh of mankind and then returning to a dreaming state only to awaken later and start the cycle again. What makes this creature so terrifying is that it can read your thoughts and determine what scares you the most. When it feeds, it acts as a reflector of your greatest fears. One of the things that makes this creature truly monstrous is that it chooses to feed on children simply because it's easier to do so. 
Children, unlike adults, have very simple fears. The monster under the bed, the vampire outside the window, the swamp monster under the lake. Adulthood fears are more complicated. It's easier to transform into a werewolf than to kill someone with the fear of missing their mortgage payment or something. What I really like about this book is how the malevolence of this creature, driven by only the desire to consume, to satiate its own pleasures, affects the town of Derry. Everyone who lives there knows that there is something wrong with Derry, but they choose to turn away from it because it is easier to turn away from the unspeakable evils which are occurring all around you than it is to stand up to it. This evil is powerful beyond comprehension, and no one person could ever hope to stand against it alone. That was part of how it was able to keep killing for so long. Stephen King also has a couple of other interesting books that depict pretty creepy aliens, like the Tommyknockers and also Dreamcatcher, and coincidentally, the main four characters in that book were raised in the town of Derry, sometime after it was supposedly banished. Because Stephen King has a really cool shared universe in his books, and I really enjoy that sort of thing. Okay, honorable mentions as far as books go. The Overlords from Arthur C. Clarke's Childhood's End. I also covered this book in my video, The First Aliens. The aliens in this one look like literal demons, so you know, spooky. Okay, it's time to talk about Star Trek. I don't know if I've ever said this, but I love Star Trek. Star Trek The Next Generation was my first love, but I also really enjoyed Deep Space Nine and Voyager, and recently Strange New Worlds. Star Trek has some of the most beloved characters ever created, but it also isn't short of creepy entities. Let's start by discussing one of the most unsettling episodes of Star Trek The Next Generation, Season 2's Where Silence Has Lease. In this episode, the crew of the Enterprise encounter an area in space that is totally black. No stars, no light, just nothing. Being that the Enterprise crew is on an exploratory mission, they choose to enter the void, only to afterwards find out that they cannot escape. After a bunch of really eerie and strange shenanigans, the creature tormenting them finally shows itself. It is an alien entity known as Nagilam. It is essentially all-powerful in this region of space. It attempts to take a human form, but appears as an uncanny, distorted face. Like some mad scientist, it performs experiments on the Enterprise crew, even brutally killing a member of the bridge crew in cold blood in order to observe death. The creature then announces that it will kill about a third of the crew in various ways in order to test all of the manners in which humans can die. It is up to Captain Picard to thwart this entity, which sees humans as no more than fodder for its experiments. This is one of my favorite episodes of Star Trek The Next Generation, and this was before the show got officially good in many people's eyes. I personally think Nagilam is one of the creepiest alien beings to ever appear in the Star Trek universe, and they should totally bring him back in a newer episode in the series, now that we have like four different Star Trek shows happening now. If Nagilam doesn't do it for you, let's talk about another of the creepiest alien adversaries to ever appear in Star Trek, the Borg. So most people probably know about the Borg. The Borg first appear in the Next Generation episode, Q Hu. Q, an essentially all-powerful alien life form, manages to thrust the Enterprise further into their galaxy than mankind has ever traveled. Somewhere out there in the darkness of space, they encounter for the first time the Borg. The Borg aren't even entirely composed of one specific species. In fact, many different biological species make up the Borg. This is because for many thousands of years, the Borg have been assimilating any new species and technologies that they could make useful to themselves. The Borg are hive-minded, unrelenting. The Borg are all about sameness and conforming. They reject individuality. All of these are antithetical to the values of the Federation. The Borg by far are the greatest adversaries the Federation ever encountered. Their conflict spans across several Star Trek shows and at least one movie. Honestly, there are so many scary aliens in Star Trek, so many scary alien episodes just the next generation alone. 
There's the episode where Lieutenant Barkley is afraid of the transporter, which why wouldn't you be because it literally takes your atoms apart and rematerializes you somewhere else. How can you even be sure that your consciousness is even regenerated and that that is the same consciousness and not just a clone of your consciousness, which was dematerialized and thus destroyed? It opens up a whole can of worms, but anyway, Barkley is the only one that realizes that there's a monstrous alien in the transporter. There's also the episode Clues, where the crew loses their memory in a strange region of space and they have to uncover that mystery. And there is one truly terrifying episode where the android Data is having waking dreams and well, there's no spooky aliens in this episode, but there is this scene. Please, don't hurt me, Data. I am sorry, Counselor. No, don't! No! No! Data! You know what? Just watch Star Trek The Next Generation if you haven't seen it. It's my favorite show of all time. And honestly, it's just great and thoughtful and the cast is so amazing and they have so much chemistry. There are some bad episodes, especially in the first two seasons, but the cast more than makes up for it. Whenever I need to deal with like a huge moral quandary, I just think WWPD, what would Picard do? And it works every time. Okay, so since we're getting extremely nerdy, now we might as well talk about Doctor Who. If you asked a Doctor Who fan what the scariest alien creature was from the entire show, I think most people would either say the silence or the weeping angels. Yes, both of those are insanely terrifying, but we're not gonna focus on them. Instead, we're gonna focus on what I honestly think might be the creepiest Doctor Who episode of all, season four's Midnight. This episode scared the balls off of me. <laughs> so in this episode, the Doctor is visiting a resort on a crystalline planet. There is a train that does a tour of the world and the Doctor decides to take the tour. Something happens, however, deep in the crystalline planes of the world. The train breaks down and something from the outside world, which should be toxic to all life, enters the train. The creature, whatever it is, never shows a form of its own. It jumps into a woman aboard the train and uses her to mimic and eventually learn their language. It somehow affects the humans aboard the train through suggestion. It makes them paranoid and angry with each other. Eventually, they even turn on the doctor who is the only one who sees this creature for what it really is. Something terrible and forgotten that waited out there in the crystalline abyss had attempted to catch a ride with them, so to speak. This is without a doubt one of the creepiest episodes of Doctor Who. 10 out of 10, would recommend. All right, so we can't really talk about scary aliens and TV shows without talking about the X-Files. I love the X-Files for all its plot holes and narratives that go nowhere. I really do think that The X-Files, like a lot of shows from that era, suffers, early on especially, from the lack of consideration to continuity and the lack of connectivity between narratives that we've come to expect from modern shows. I really enjoy The X-Files though, and even though I haven't seen it as much as Doctor Who and Star Trek, The X-Files absolutely shaped my taste in creepy aliens growing up. And if you're a fan of science fiction, it's likely that you've been influenced by this show without even realizing it because it gets referenced everywhere. Okay, now let's get to some scary alien movies that I like. Now again, keep in mind, these are just my opinions. Also, I can't include every alien flick in this video. But anyway, without further ado, let's start off with John Carpenter's They Live. They Live is a fantastic movie. The thing is, however, you gotta get through the first 30 minutes of it, and then trust me, it's worth it. John Carpenter lulls you into a false sense of familiarity with this film. You think, I'm just watching some cheesy 80s movie, and yes, yes you are, but there's so many more layers to it. Spoiler alert, if you haven't seen the movie, because I'm basically about to spoil everything here, Skip ahead about three minutes if you don't want to hear any spoilers. In Carpenter's film, They Live, our protagonist discovers that aliens have actually taken over the Earth, but he only realizes this to be the truth after he puts on special glasses that reveal it to him. These glasses also reveal that all of our advertisements and TV are really just subliminal messages meant to keep us docile and complacent. 
What's great about this is that for the first 30 minutes or so, the score is just this weird 80s hokey noir melody that just repeats over and over again. And that somehow totally disarms you. And when he puts on the glasses, it goes entirely silent. And it's horrifying. This movie kind of works for the same reason that The Matrix works. A lot of us have the sense that there is a secret world underneath the world. That there are sinister intentions lurking behind every corner. A grand conspiracy that we could glimpse if only we could just focus the lens of our perception properly. The Xenomorph from Ridley Scott's Alien is without a doubt one of the scariest alien beings ever put on screen. This creature came straight out of the mind of H.R. Giger, whose dark and twisted creations were rivaled by no other. Everyone knows about the Xenomorph, but as promised, we're going to talk about one of Giger's lesser known creations, one which arguably was more dear to him than the Xenomorph. I'm talking of course about Syl from 1999 Species. Betcha didn't see that coming. Well, you probably did since I mentioned it earlier. Species is a film about scientists who receive a signal from outer space. It is from an alien race of beings. The signal contains the genetic information of aliens and details on how to combine it with our own DNA. The scientists believing that they could contain the creation allowed the experiment to go forward, creating Sill. However, once Sill reaches adolescence, in a shockingly short period of time, the decision is made to terminate the project. But before she can be killed, Sill escapes. On her own, she pupates into a fully grown woman. And then the breeding drive is activated. Sill desperately wants to mate. But you know it's kind of hard to find a good man who's a match for you when you're an ultra-intelligent apex predator from another world. From all the stories that I've heard, Giger was absolutely in love with his character, design, and concept. He even spent his own money to create the scene in the movie with the alien monster train when the studio wouldn't pay for it. Syl was designed to be sexually provocative and terrifying at the same time. She was the embodiment of the mixture of horror and sexuality that was definitive of so much of Giger's work. What makes Syl scary is that she looks like a woman most of the time, but in actuality she is a biological weapon. She was sent to Earth to breed. Her children would breed and eventually the biologically superior aliens would dominate the Earth. Humanity would be replaced. Now of course the movie itself has flaws and definitely not everything in it is completely original. It borrows heavily from movies like The Thing and of course Alien. It's still pretty fun to watch regardless, and the concept, when you extrapolate just a little bit, is terrifying. There's something about the way the aliens are depicted in signs that is still horrifying to me. They radiate malice, and there is a sinister veil that drapes this entire film because of it. So if you haven't seen Signs, then what are you doing? Go watch Signs, seriously. In case you don't know, Signs is a movie about a family on a farm who have crop circles start to appear in their fields. Over time, the family and the world come to realize that the planet is in fact being invaded by malicious alien life forms. What I really like about this movie is though you get the sense that the invasion is occurring everywhere and that society is kind of falling apart, the focus remains on just one family. So we really get to develop these characters and develop a really interesting family dynamic. So you really root for their survival in this movie. Also, I feel like Science has a very satisfying ending. Some movies take you on a good ride, but then the ending kind of sucks. Here is not the case. This was the height of M. Night Shyamalan, and this film does not disappoint. The Thing is, of course, another classic science fiction alien. I know, two John Carpenter films on the list. I just wanted to space things out a little bit. The alien monster in The Thing is one of the most terrifying creatures to ever be featured in a science fiction movie, period. What makes The Thing so creepy is the fact that it doesn't really have a form of its own. It needs a host to infect and imitate. It's more of a virus than a monster, really. Part of what's really creepy about The Thing, and part of what helps the movie itself be creepy, is the paranoia that occurs when we as the audience, as well as the characters in the story, realize that The Thing could be anyone at any given time. 
It has the ability to perfectly imitate a human or any organism, really. The thing could be your best friend and you would never know. Also, the dog transformation scene has stuck with me for years. So yeah, if you haven't seen the thing, watch it. Do not watch the 2011 prequel because it is terrible. So the movie Life is in a way almost a spiritual successor to the thing. I mean, the creature doesn't masquerade in the form of a person, but it shares the similarity of being an almost unstoppable biological weapon. So in space, these scientists encounter a strange, never before seen life form. They name it Calvin. Calvin then proceeds to kill them all. We know this story, we've all seen Alien, but what I like about this movie is that eventually the characters just realize that they can't even really do anything about it. All they can really do is attempt to keep the creature, whatever this life form is, from reaching Earth. Because obviously this is an apex predator, and humanity cannot coexist with it. Definitely give the movie Life a try if you haven't watched it. Also, Rebecca Ferguson, who plays the Lady Jessica in Dune, is one of the main characters, and she's pretty good in this. The film Fire in the Sky is supposedly based upon a true alien abduction story. Whether that's true or not is beyond the point. I think it's safe to say that Fire in the Sky definitely gave many people abduction nightmares, even if they were never actually abducted themselves, because I know it gave me nightmares. I don't think I've seen an alien abduction scene as frightening as the one in Fire in the Sky. So Fire in the Sky is about these friends that were out at night and one of them gets abducted. They all report seeing it and there is no evidence of foul play. But the big twist is the friend actually ends up showing again and his description of the alien abduction is so freaky and the way they handle this scene in the movie is so creepy and so freakish it will send shivers down your spine. Fire in the Sky is a bit of a slow burn, but it's definitely worth it just for the alien examination scene, in my opinion. Alright, so last but not least, The Faculty. So one of my favorite alien movies as a kid was The Faculty, and if you haven't seen The Faculty, just do yourself a favor and watch it. It's great. It's essentially a retelling of Invasion of the Body Snatchers that takes place in a high school in the 90s, where the teachers and eventually the students are slowly being replaced by aliens from another planet. The creature design in this movie is so interesting and grossly freakish, and the cast here is amazing. Elijah Wood before Lord of the Rings, Jon Stewart randomly plays the science teacher, we've got Piper Laurie from the original adaptation of Stephen King's Carrie, we've got Famke Jansen from X-Men and that one episode of Star Trek TNG, and we've even got Usher making an appearance here. What I really like about this film is it's just fun and it's really exciting watching it for the first time because you really get to play that guessing game of who is the alien, it could be anybody, and also this scene. So the point of all this is aliens are freaky. The idea of being alone in the universe and the idea of not being alone are equally terrifying. Imagining an alien race with superior technology and biology to our own is frightening because in their position we know how we as a species would react. And also the idea of aliens causing changes to our biology is scary because it brings into question what it even means to be human in the first place. We would all like to have the optimistic view of aliens. And maybe we will get the luck of the draw and the first alien life we encounter will be akin to the Vulcans from Star Trek. And instead of subjugating us and draining our planet of resources, they will induct us into a kind of federation of planets. I can dream, can't I? Either way, I think alien life will always be kind of scary to us. Even if we did encounter a friendly race of alien beings that weren't hostile, would we even be able to trust them? Humans don't even trust each other. And I think that about covers it for this video. You know there's also my own personal favorite explanation for UFOs, and that's that we're in a simulation, and the so-called UFOs are just the sim technicians coming to take a look at things. But of course, we're probably not in a simulation. I hope you've enjoyed my big alien Halloween special. Thanks for watching guys, make sure you like and subscribe for more Daba Waba Daba Laugh. Gamba Goji? Mibi Hoba.
Reptoshiglodoba? Mimiwa. Gumbledolf? Bamborgi! Oh! Yes. Sabito! Yes. Suffer. Ah. And I'll just oh. make him piss himself. Take away all of his friends. Oh, hey, organism. You still up playing Sims? Oh, it's you. Yeah, I've been playing it for hours now. Oh, Mabita! I just don't see what you see in that game. Well, I don't see what you see in reading. Oh, this character, huh? What a weird looking huh? guy. Make him get abducted again. That was cool. It's really compelling torturing this guy. Anyway, I'm going to bed. Yes. Yes, run off to bed, Quinn. One day, I'll do this to the real you. Oh!